بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا Again, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone. For, thank you for being here as well as those who are watching online. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we are continuing our reading of Purification of the Heart, which is the English translation of Madharat al Qulub by Imam al Mawlud. This was, of course, done by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, who is local to us here in the Bay Area. Alhamdulillah. We uh, started already um, reading the book, so for those who don't have it, please do look into getting it so that you can read along with us. You can also watch the previous recordings. But we're going to pick up from, on page four. So if you have the book, please do take it out and we'll read from the bottom of page four where we have freedom and purification. So now Imam Maulud speaks next about freedom, which is achieved when one realizes the qualities of shame and humility and empties oneself of their opposites, shamelessness and arrogance. If you recall, before we got to this section, we talked about the two prerequisites of purification, which are acquiring uh, these two virtues of humility and, and modesty, right? And part of that is to, again, understand the utility of shame, because shame can be useful. It's, it's, it is an essential um, uh, you know, process that we should, um, we should know, we should we should incorporate, right, self, and this is self-accountability. It's not external shame from other people. It's just being aware of one's sin sinfulness, showing contrition, showing remorse. Um, so developing that is essential to the purification process. With these qualities come true freedom, wealth, and dignity, which require manumission from the bonds of one's whims which is becoming free, right, from, from the bonds of, of our desires. People may claim to be free, yet they cannot control themselves from gluttony in the presence of food or from illicit sexual relations when the opportunity presents itself. Such a notion of freedom is devoid of substance. And you can see that in our culture here, right? Um, one of the tragic things is that childhood in, in this society is often really the preparation of when, you know, you, a person reaches the age of adulthood that all of a sudden all of these things that they, you know, were not able to do, they can suddenly do, most of which is very harmful, right? So uh, whether it's 18 or 21, depending on, on what it is, but that's sort of the idea that a lot of young children are given even as uh, they're young, right? Not yet. You can't do that yet, but at a certain point you can do it all, and it's so exciting. And so they build it up and build it up, but what they don't realize is that, of course, they're just pushing children into very destructive behaviors um, and also enslaving them or, or preparing them for, for uh, you know, them to become enslaved by their own desires. That's really what all of that conditioning is. Freedom has real meaning when, for example, a situation of temptation arises and one remains God-fearing, steadfast, and in control of one's actions. This holds true even when the temptation produces flickers of desire in a person who nonetheless refrains from indulging. Imam al-Ghazali speaks at length about the desires of our limbs and organs and refers to the stomach and the genitals as being the two dominators. If they are under control, all other aspects of desire are kept in check. So just a, a little bit about that. To when, when real opportunity for temptation arises, especially when we talk about, you know, some of the, uh, the, the things that are very open in this society, um, we have to remember that, you know, the, there, there are people who, um, there's a hadith where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that seven people will be under, under his shade on the day of judgment. And among that are it is, uh, is counted the one who is, you know, on the brink of basically doing something um, haram uh, in respects to, um, uh, you know, um, an illicit relationship, let's just say, and they remember God in that moment, and then they stop, right? So this is a very, um, it's a sign of, of immense faith to be able to do that. 
right? And so we are just keeping that in mind. And then as far as, you know, uh, what Imam al-Ghazali says about the desires of the stomach and the, 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 the private parts, this is also important to understand. I think last time I may have introduced it. I've been giving so many different uh, talks on this subject that I, it's all a bit a blur, but I may have introduced the... Um, the triune nature of the human being, right? That this is something that many of our scholars mention, in particular Imam al-Ghazali, that to understand that the human being is, is uh, comprised of three parts, right? So you have the intellect, which is represented by uh, the man or, or you know, thinking uh, person. So there's a, that's the, 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 the analogy or, or the example given for the intellect is a person who's thinking, right? A reasoning person. And then you have emotions, which are uh, the uh, example given for emotions or the analogy is it's like a dog, right? But not just any dog. It's a hunting dog or a guard dog, right? A dog that has a purpose that can be trained. So you want to think of your emotions as being useful and necessary, right? But it ha they have to be trained. You can't just be uh, triggered by everything and overly emotional about everything. You have to know what is the right appropriate uh, emotion per circumstance, right? So emotions have to be seen as, as the same way you would see a dog or an animal that you would train. And then the appetites are uh, represented by a pig. So w this is helpful, again, I mean, even young children learning this can really help to understand why when we see ourselves in these three ways, then we understand that the most balanced human being is the one who who's intellect is governing, right? Which is why uh, even our teachers point out like the, the head, right? The mind is at the top of our bodies, right? And then you have the heart where our emotions reside. And then you have the stomach and the, uh, you know, the private parts, all of that being the lower part of us. So there's a reason for that because the intellect has to be governing. So if we're not able to reason through our emotions and really understand, um, you know, what, when to be angry, for example, right? A lot of people are angry. And they're, you know, they're out there um, in these very heightened emotional states. Um, and sometimes anger can be very dangerous, right? That's why we have crimes of passion, right? What are crimes of passion? These are states where people completely lose all rational thinking and act on emotion. So a jealous spouse may find something and then react in a very horrific way, um, or road rage, right? How many people have been um, devastated because someone was not able to control their anger over a simple traffic issue, right? So this is what happens when emotions get out of control and we're not able to rein them in. We are quite destructive, first and foremost to ourselves, but we also can weaponize emotions towards other people, right? Marriages have been completely broken apart because of people who are not able to maintain their emotions, right? Um, so all of this goes back to the importance of understanding your nature as a human being and knowing the order and, and the, the way to bring about balance is to always um, preserve and nurture the intellect, and how do we do that with knowledge, right? Knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowledge of the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowledge of the Prophet sallam, as the perfect example for the human being. Um, how many of us know things about the Prophet sallam, because we've heard them maybe hundreds of times, but we don't copy him on that issue? That is, we have to think about that for a moment. What does that say about our intellect? If you know that the Prophet Sallallahu did something and he is sent as the exemplar for the human being in order to help us to perfect ourselves or to reach the closest thing possible to that, and you know certain things about his way of doing things, but you opt to do things according to your own way, what does that say about your reasoning, right? For example, like earlier today we were talking, um, I, I did another class on, on uh, Clubhouse, which is an app, and we were doing agenda to change our condition. So I mentioned that there's a hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha who, uh, who said that the Prophet sallam, when he would wake up for, uh, in the morning from bed, he would emerge like a lion, basically, pouncing you know, on their prey. So um, that is a very powerful visual, right? Think about that for a moment, and think about how you wake up for Fajr. 
right? Five more minutes, 10 more minutes, right? Or we just turn over. We're, we're very, you know, slow to react in that sleepy state to our own detriment because how many times have we done that trusting ourselves only to find the next time our eyes open, it's 10 o'clock in the morning and the world is, you know, running and there we are feeling horrible and miserable. So when we hear examples like that, it's for us to reevaluate our way and say, wait a second, if the Prophet Sallallahu first of all, did that, he's teaching us something, right? It's not just for us to go, wow, he jumped out of bed like a lion. How amazing. Okay, then what? Every aspect of his life is for us to, yes, be in awe of. Yes, increase our love for him. Absolutely. But more importantly, the greatest sign of love for someone is that you emulate them, right? Children, when they follow uh, their parents, right? It increases our love because we're so happy that they're obeying us and that they're doing what we tell them to do, right? This is all ways that we show love. So when we learn about the Prophet ﷺ, um, and, and that he did certain things a certain way, it's for us to, again, emulate him. So that's where reasoning comes in, right? That we, when we're reasoning, we're really thinking on that logical level. But that can't happen if we don't have the knowledge, right? And, and, and that's why it's so important to learn, to learn about his example, to learn about his words, to learn how he reacted in different scenarios, right? When he had difficult people, for example. Some of us, our biggest challenge is likely difficult people, right? It's not even internal. It's that we have around us very difficult people to deal with. Well, we can learn from the Prophet ﷺ. He had people in his family and people in his tribe and people around him that were very difficult. But he, he teaches us by way of his example. So this is what knowledge does, is it helps us to find better ways of dealing with things and breaking free of patterns that are destructive to us, right? And so when people, you know, um, have emotional dysregulation and they don't know how to regulate their emotions, then the best thing to do is to just point them to the best of examples and say, well, learn, right? Learn from, from his example. And of course, you know, there's a lot of benefit to seeking help if you need and, and mentorship and what have you. But really the best thing that we can do for ourselves is to just learn. So this is where that understanding of the triune nature of the human being is really helpful is that, again, emotions are meant to be controlled, and then appetites as well. If we don't learn how to govern our appetites and see that they are also, um, you know, that there's a purpose for them and it's not just to uh, reign free and, and to allow ourselves to indulge every appetite, but we have to be very moderate in that because if we don't have moderation, then we have excess, and if we have excess, we harm ourselves, right? If you do anything uh, when it comes to your, your appetites that is in excess, you overeat, you can overdrink. Drinking water beyond what's normal or necessary could kill someone. Right? I mean, that's kind of shocking, right? But you could actually die from an overdose of water uh, if you overwhelm your system with that, right? Um, so any, everything in excess is harmful. And also, if it's, uh, you know, in, insufficient, it can be harmful too. So this is why balance is finding the balance, right? Like, where am I, uh, what are the boundaries? So alhamdulillah, our sharia has boundaries for our appetites, right? We have hadith that say that your stomach should be divided into thirds. A third for food, a third for water, a third for air. This is logical, it's balanced, it makes sense. So when you uh, decide to eat a pint of ice cream, although certain times of the month you can't be blamed for that, but, but if you do that, you may regret it, right, because you get the stomach ache. And we tell these things to our children, right? We know how to stop them from indulging, but it's we have to look at our own behavior because when we indulge in things like that, we're going to pay the price for it. And then also, just a good way to look at it is that if you see your, your appetites like a little monster that resides within you, then to withhold from the monster will keep it small, right? And it can't really impact you very much. But to keep feeding it, 
what's going to happen? The monster is going to grow. And when the monster grows, it's going to take over. So if you think of it in that way, then you'll realize that I need to practice restraint for my appetites. I don't need to be excessively or, um, again, you know, uh, not... Uh, you know, indulging at all, like, uh, you know, restraining too much, I need to find a balance. So just an important, um, important points there to remember. The tongue is also a formidable obstacle. There are people, for example, who appear incapable of refraining from backbiting and speaking ill of others. And they often do so without realizing it. It is common for people to dislike impoverishment or humility because they perceive them as abjectness. Yet the Prophet ﷺ chose poverty over wealth. So I'm sorry, before I, I continue, I wanted to just quickly mention about the tongue. Also, this is another really important point that we have to remember, that we have um, you know, um, inroads to the heart, right, to the spiritual heart. And we'll, inshallah, get to them soon. But one of them is the tongue. So if we don't learn to control our speech and make sure that when we speak we're always truthful, and that we're not engaging in idle talk, right, then this will affect our spiritual heart. So this is why, you know, making sure that the company you keep is really good company. If you have people who like to gossip and who are always, you know, tearing other people down, you are um, held accountable when you listen to that because your, uh, your ears, first of all, are engaging, right? You're, you're giving them an audience, but it doesn't absolve you from blame just because you're not saying anything. So you want to be mindful, like, why are you accumulating sin for another person's, you know, insecurities? Like, let them, you know, I mean, it's always best to, to advise them and tell them, you know, it's not right, we shouldn't talk about people. Uh, but if you find that they don't listen to you and they don't really care and they keep doing it, then that's when a boundary needs to be imposed. And you need to say, you know, I, I, I just, I really don't want to talk about that person or please don't tell me about people's business, you know. Um, I, I, it's not good for our hearts or whatever you want to say, but you have to have a line. And if you're not strong enough to, to put that line, then you're going to suffer the consequences of their sins because you're partaking in them by giving them an audience. So we have to be better about establishing some boundaries in our friendships or even in our personal relationships. Sometimes it's not a friend, it's your sibling. Sometimes it's your mom. Sometimes it's your dad. But when you speak the truth um, and you do it with obviously respect and adab, you're, you don't have to be rude, you don't have to be self-righteous and act like you're better than them. Um, and just a tip, when you're advising, it's always really good to include yourself in that. You know, it's, it's going to go much better if you say, we shouldn't do this, right? As opposed to stop gossiping, <laughs> right? Nobody wants to be reprimanded and, and scolded like that. And nafs, you know, their nafs will just um, not hear it. But if you do a gentle reminder, a loving reminder that says, I'm looking out for you like I'm looking out for myself, then hopefully that person will get it. And if they don't get it right then and there, make dua, inshallah, they'll get it, you know, eventually, inshallah. But we'll guard your tongue. So now back to um, impoverishment. It's common for people to dislike impoverishment or humility because they perceive them as abjectness. Yet the Prophet ﷺ chose poverty over wealth. He did not have money in his home. He did not have jewelry. He slept on the floor upon a bed made of leather that was stuffed with palm fibers. And he had two pillows in his room for guests. In much of today's culture, living this way would be considered extreme poverty. Imam Maulud stresses that dignity with God comes to those who are humble before him, those who place prime value on how they are received by their maker and not by how they will be judged by the ephemeral norms of people. Dignity and honor are gifts. The Quran says about God, you exalt whomever you will and you debase whomever you will. Chapter 3, verse 26. Proofs of this divine law abound. There are many accounts, for example, of people who were once in positions of authority and wealth, but now find themselves as paupers, completely stripped of their former glory, reduced in many instances to wards of the state. God is powerful, powerful over all things, and all good 
authority and provision are in his hand, not ours. Um, you know, this idea that people's entire realities can be altered is something that really should, you know, stay with us. That whatever circumstance you find yourself in today could very well be different tomorrow. And it is entirely up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's his decree. He could wish for you either more, right? right? If you're grateful, I will increase you. Or he could uh, test you and completely remove one, two, three, or more of your blessings. Now having that awareness um, will, should immediately put you in a state of humility, right? That Allah could take all of this away from me at any point. There are people who, whose entire lives have been completely flipped upside down in a matter of not just a day, in a matter of minutes or seconds. Think of earthquakes or fires or other natural calamities that have literally leveled entire cities, right? Think of a person whose wealth was invested in something that tanks. You know, there's like, for example, right now we all know there's a crisis happening in the world. Uh, it's very serious, and the stock markets are absolutely being affected. People have lost wealth. So I was just, uh, the last point I was making is that, um, you know, we see examples all the time where people's circumstances completely change. Um, and that's really important to keep in mind because that's how we stay humble, right? That um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he wishes to, he could remove our blessings and put us into further tests. And that's why, you know, many of our scholars have remarked on um, just giving us perspective, right? And I've shared this, the famous story of Ibn al with his teacher um, about the four states that people can be in. But these are things that we should really remember, memorize. Because when we memorize these things, then when we're um, in those moments of wallowing in self-pity, right, which a lot of times the nafs will want us to do, oh, woe is me, why me? These are all shaitanic thoughts, right? Because they're actual accusations. If you think about when you say, why me? Why did this happen, happen to me? Who are you accusing, right? That's why we have to be very careful with those types of thoughts because they break our trust in God that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees something for you, there is khair in it. You, it's your job to determine what that is. It's your job to, to reflect and to figure out why. But to just say, why me? Or I didn't deserve this. I did everything right. Um, is an accusation against God. It's a claim of injustice being done to you. So it's very dangerous. But the way that we protect ourselves is to remember, again, that there are four states that every person can be in. And all of them are tests, right? Sometimes we think that people are only tested with hardship, but that's not true. You can be tested with blessing, right? So if you have a lot of wealth, if you've been given, you know, wonderful family uh, upbringing, you have had an extraordinary education, you, um, your, your home life is really blessed, blessed, you know, you just feel like everywhere, mashallah, it's ease, doors always seem to open for you, you have privilege, um, you have beauty, you have knowledge, you have lineage. These are gifts from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they're also responsibilities, right, that you will be tested. What are you doing with those blessings, right? Are you just living it up and enjoying life and you're in your own bubble and your own reality? Do you think of other people? Do you help other people? Do you uh, share your blessings with other people? Are you in a state of gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or do you assume it's all because of your efforts? Are you deluded by your own ego to think that you did it? You went to the school. You, you, you go to work. You get that you know, money and, and it's all your efforts. Or do you attribute your blessings to God? So the, the test of the person who has blessing is gratitude, right? That you are constantly in a state of gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a test. The test for the person who is in tribulation is patience. So that means what? It doesn't mean you have to love your tribulation. No. You can be sad about it. You can be unhappy about it. But don't let 
your heart turn from God, where you start to look at God with uh, this Audhu Billah, again, lens that somehow he's put you in, an, in a, you know, that he's trying you and testing you unjustly. That is a demonic thought, right? It's from shaitan. So you want to be very careful to uh, control those thoughts and just to remember there's wisdom, there's wisdom, there's wisdom. Even if I never learn of it in this world, I have to have trust that God knows what's best for me. And because it happened, there is wisdom in it, right? As the Prophet ﷺ said, that how wondrous is the affair of the believer in every circumstance, right? It's good. It's all good. Alhamdulillah ala kulli hal. In every circumstance, for the believer only, is it good. So if you're a believer and you're being tested with something, it is good for you. Even if the external reality seems not so, it's good for you. That's the second test. Then there's the you know, state of being in guidance. So if you have hidayah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're a Muslim, you, you pray, you believe, you do all of the things that you should be doing. This is, of course, a blessing as well, but it's also a test in that, again, who do you think is the one that uh, you, you know, or who do you credit for your guidance? Do you think it's you? Because self-righteousness and arrogance is easy or can easily overcome people who are uh, religious, right? I'm sure we've all seen that in our lives from people who, um, whether they're family members or strangers, you see self-righteousness. And I'll tell you a story because it's, um, it's an important lesson that I had to learn many, many years ago. Some of you may heard, have heard this story, but um, just to, you know, to be real here, um, many years ago, I, when I was first practicing Islam, I came into this understanding of Islam that basically was very um, externally focused, always looking at other people, judging other people. Um, it was just the norm. That's what I did. I would look at how women were dressed, and I would make judgments about them. I would look at how people prayed, and I would make judgments about them. I would want to know what is their uh, manhaj or, or way of practicing. I would inquire very inappropriately because that's what I was taught was what we should be doing, gatekeeping, policing, whatever you want to call it. So one day, this was many years ago, I was um, at the airport, and I had just come from a flight, and I was waiting for someone to pick me up. And so when I was outside, this was before, I think, even 9-11 maybe, um, there were, uh, I was sitting outside, and I was waiting for my ride. And so I was just people watching, you know, waiting there, looking around. And I see a car pull up to, um, you know, the, the terminal. And they, they actually parked right in, across from where I was sitting. This was at the Oakland Airport here in the Bay Area. So I was sitting there and just watching. And this lady came out of her car. And she was in a tank top and shorts. And she had blonde hair. She was a white uh, woman. And immediately my mind went to all the thoughts that, you know, astaghfirullah, look at her, how is she dressed, how inappropriate. And I just had a lot of bad thoughts about her, negative thoughts about her. And in the midst of judging this woman, um, I noticed that she had her trunk up. She was doing something in the back of her car. She puts the trunk down, and then she looks right at me, and she starts to walk towards me. Um, and that was strange, <laughs> obviously, because, you know, it's, I, 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 I don't know her. I don't know why she's looking at me, and I don't know why she's walking towards me. But she comes right in front of me, and subhanAllah, at this point, my heart is beating a little bit because I'm like, this is odd. Like, it's as if I felt kind of exposed. Like, you know, I had all these negative thoughts about her, and <laughs> did she hear them? You know, that's kind of where my mind was like, why is she here? She comes and she stands right in front of me and in the most humble disposition. I will not forget her head hanging low. She's looking at herself and me and she just says, Salaamu Alaikum. And I'm like shocked beyond belief because those are the last words that I would imagine that this woman was to even know, let alone say. And she said, I know I'm not dressed appropriately, but I am a Muslim. And then she said, I saw you and... I thought it was like a sign from God that I should come talk to you because I have a child and I want to raise him Muslim, but I don't know where to get books. And she said all of these things to me. And my mind is just like, like, I just instantly felt like, uh, it was like actually like a punch to the gut because 
moments before I had judged this woman so harshly. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was teaching me a very valuable lesson that I never forgot. That who do you think you are, right? Here I am dressed head to toe. I was wearing abaya, hijab, completely covered. But my internal was so ugly, right? So externally I may have looked the part, but what was my internal state as I'm judging this woman? And here's this woman who externally doesn't fit, you know, she didn't look, even she recognized it herself. She wasn't dressed appropriately, but her internal state was so humble and so beautiful, and she was seeking God, and she wanted to be right. And she took me as a sign of God, and I took her as a sign of what, Jahannam? I don't know, but I, it was just... You know, I, I talked to her, I, I gave her my information, and I, I got through that conversation. But what I was left with was absolute humility and, to be, and, and feeling of humiliation before God, which was good. It was a good form of humiliation for me because I realized that all those years of me stressing um, to, to others and to myself about the importance of dress and outward, you know, the way we present ourselves, I had neglected my internal state to be even in a situation like that and make presumptions about someone that's a perfect stranger, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught me in that moment that don't get ahead of yourself just because you wear the hijab and you pray and you're practicing Islam. Don't get ahead of yourself and think you're better. And alhamdulillah, that's where, again, when we have guidance, we have to keep our nafs in check and make sure it never starts to think it of itself as better than anyone. There could be someone, a perfect stranger, as was this, you know, in this situation, who outwardly maybe denies God, who outwardly says horrible things, but we don't know their end, right? And we don't know our end. And that awareness is what keeps us humble. We simply don't know. We, that's why we always ask for what? Right? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us a good end because we could be doing everything right, but at the last minute of our lives, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't will for us guidance, we could be misguided. May Allah protect all of us from that. But it's very important to stay in that humble state. So that is a test. Guidance, the test of guidance is to keep your ego in check, to never get ahead of yourself and think you're um, better than anyone, and to also attribute your guidance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever good you do, it's guidance from Allah. It's not because of your efforts. If you uh, wake up and you um, you know pray extra rakat or you do anything extra, you're able to give to charity. Everything is by the permission of Allah and by the mercy of Allah and by the fadl, the, the, you know, the, 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 the favor of God upon you. But it's not because you're generous, you're pious, you have all of these uh, virtues that we, we tell ourselves, right? So that's the third state. And then the fourth state is misguidance. So if that's your state, if you're in a state of, of um, where you're doing haram and you're doing things you shouldn't be doing, then your test is to return to God, right? To never make your sins bigger than God because sometimes people... You know, this is also one of the traps of shaitan, is that he'll make us think that we're so far gone that Allah will not forgive us. And I've worked with people who that's what they think, that I'm such a sinner that, you know, I, I'm not good enough for this deen. And I'm not good enough to pray. I'm not good enough to do these things. These are all demonic thoughts. So if you're in a state where you're sinful and you've been making the same mistake a hundred times, a thousand times, however many times, don't... Um, impose or don't close doors upon yourself when God keeps them all open, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept the door of rahmah always, or tawbah always open for us. It's just our job to seek that. So those are the four states. And if you're aware of these four states and you're really understanding, then when you look out into the world and if you're, let's say, struggling financially and you see other people who have wealth, you don't make conclusions that, oh, they're ha they have it so much better than I do. Or when you see people in, in happy relationships and you're in a struggling relationship, you don't make assumptions that, oh, 
God loves them more than he loves me. Those are shaitanic thoughts. What you say is, they have their test, I have my test. I need to fix myself. I need to focus on my test. I need to stop worrying about what other people are going through. And sure, you can will, wish good for them, but to focus on other people at the expense of focusing on yourself is why so many of us are in trouble. We're always looking outward and thinking, why don't I have this or why don't I have that? And in that, what do we do? We deny our blessings because all of us, regardless, even the one who's being tested with tribulation is in fact in blessing because what? It could always be worse, right? And that's, uh, those are the, the other perspective that we need, that your tests could always be worse. You could, it could be in your uh, dunya and not in your akhira, right? And it could be in this world, uh, it could be in the next world, not in this world. So when you think of your tests, you have to put them in that, you know, that context as well. So these are all reminders for us to remember that, again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who, only one who exalts, and he's the only one who debases, right? From this, we derive an important principle. If one ignobly pursues an attribute, he or she will be donned with its opposite. God humbles and humiliates the haughty ones those who arrogantly seek out rank and glory before the eyes of people. So you see, they're seeking position, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala debases them. I read a story recently about someone who said they were at a restaurant and, um, and someone was so cruel and just ruthless to the server over their dish. You know, sometimes people lose it, right? And just to show you the proof of this, so they um, were scolding and yelling and really being vulgar, and they said, they witnessed all of this happen in front, like in real time. They said, the man got up, yelled at this person, said some horrible things, brought them to tears. Then as soon as he got up and walked out, he fell flat on his face. Right? That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Like you don't, you don't think you can walk around treating people like that you're better than them because that's, Allah will show you, right? He shows people all the time, but we just don't make the connections. So if you're going to be haughty and arrogant, then be prepared to be humiliated in this way. Be prepared to be exposed and to be, uh, because your intentions are not noble. You're just seeking, you're, you're trying to puff yourself up or look as though you're important or act as though you're important, act as though you're better. Well, when you do things like that, then you're asking for the wrath of God. The Qur'an gives the examples of Fir'aun and Korah and their abject fall and disgrace. Conversely, so the opposite of that is, if one is humble before God, he will render him or her honorable. So every time we debase ourselves or, or we lower ourselves before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and show that humility to him, he will honor us because that is, uh, you know, his reward for our humility. So humility is always the answer. And you see a lot of people who, this, they, they've missed this, right? They, they unfortunately are, um, are, you know, are, uh, are taught or, or believe the opposite, which is just to uh, arrogate themselves and, and to speak as though they are something they're not. So Imam Malud goes on to explain that there is no salvation like the heart's salvation, given that all the limbs and organs respond to its desires. If one's heart is safe, so too are the limbs and organs, for they carry out the deeds inspired by the heart. The limbs and organs of the corrupt become instruments through which corruption is spread. As the Qur'an states, Today we shall set a seal upon their mouths, and their hands will speak to us, and their feet shall bear witness to what they have earned. That's chapter 36, verse 65. And spend on the needy in the way of God, and do not throw yourselves into ruin by your own hands. Chapter 2, verse 195. And we shall say, taste the chastisement of burning. That is for what your hands have forwarded for yourselves. And God never wrongs his servants. That's chapter 3, verse 181 to 82. They shall have immense torment on the day when their tongues and their hands and their legs bear witness against them for what they had been doing. Chapter 24, verse 23 to 24. So all this is to say what? That our uh, bodies, right, will all be witnesses against us. Everything that we do, all of the haram that we're doing, don't think that it's going to just go away. I mean, inshallah, with Tawbah, 
if we're really uh, sincere, then yes, Allah subhanahu wa can erase it all. But if we don't do that, then they will bear witness against us, right? According to a hadith, the tongue is the interpreter of the heart. Hypocrisy is wretched because the hypocrite says with his tongue what is not in his heart. His wrong, he wrongs his tongue and oppresses his heart. But if the heart is sound, the condition of the tongue follows suit. We are commanded to be upright in our speech, which is a gauge of the heart's state. According to a prophetic tradition, each morning when the limbs and organs awaken in the spiritual world, they shudder and say to the tongue, Fear God concerning us. For if you are upright, then we are upright. And if you deviate, we too deviate. Engaging in the regular remembrance of God, dhikr, safeguards the tongue and replaces idle talk with words and phrases that raise one in honor. The tongue is essential in developing courtesy with God, which is the whole point of existence. So alhamdulillah, I'm going to, I think, stop here because I wanted to open it up for um, questions and uh, anything that anyone wants to add. I know I did, uh, someone had asked, did you still have a question? Yeah? Oh, okay. Inshallah, inshallah after the class. Inshallah, inshallah after the class. Alhamdulillah. Anyone have any uh, questions or anything to share? Yes, Assalamualaikum. Exactly. No, I'm so glad you mentioned that because that is something that we don't think about, that if we're preoccupied in one problem, then in many ways Allah is protecting us from a host of other problems, right? So you kind of have to look at it like, better this than something worse, right? So if I have difficult family members, if I have, you know, financial issues, as, uh, you know, we, I mentioned before, when problems are in your dunya, right, and they're not in your deen, they're not, they don't afflict your faith, it's considered a huge blessing, right? Because if you are having a faith crisis, this is, of course, far worse. Uh, because I'm, you know, only Allah can at that point. It's, it's, you know, but, but when it's dunya, it's just you being tested, you having to, you know, maybe uh, call on, uh, you know, someone and get some counsel. You know, find like a worldly means to to solve the issue, and it can be done, right? Sometimes we just have to be creative, um, but with time and experience, we learn, right? And that's one of the blessings of going through challenges. Um, I mean, just in my life experience, alhamdulillah, you know, since um, I can remember, I've always kind of been in a position of having to um, deal with or somehow be involved in in problems, right, at a, at a community level, I guess you could say, like working within the community, um, helping people with different problems. But I have found within my own life that has been such a blessing to be able to be involved in serving the community's needs because I learn a lot of lessons when I'm helping other people, right? Which is why service is a great way of protecting your heart and protecting yourself. When you're in the khidmah of other people and you're helping other people in one capacity or another, A, you know, you're doing a, a immense work, you know, that, that is blessed work, but also you're learning lessons that will help you when it, the time comes, right? Because you'll remember like, oh, this is, you know, I remember a situation similar to this and now I'm dealing with it, right? And I'll give you uh, just a, a quick example of that, um, of how uh, when you're helping other people with their problems, it can come, all of that help can come back to you, right? So many years ago, this was just like I said, I always say, and if you follow me on online, you know, like I, I say there's no coincidences because there aren't, there aren't any coincidences, all, everything's, Allah plans it all. So I had a situation where when I was in my previous marriage, um, and I've talked about this before, but, you know, my, um, my, uh, I had a, uh, well, let's backtrack here. So my, um, a relative of my ex's in my previous marriage had come to visit and she stayed with us for a while. And she came because her situation was that her and her husband were going through infertility. And so she stayed with us, I think, for like a summer, like two or three months. And that time was me basically, you know, every day helping her get through her struggle of accepting the fact that she may never be a mother. And day after day, we would talk, we would go out, we would go to eat, we would go shopping. You know, she's close, so we were spending so much time together. But that was what 
I ended up, you know, doing. I had no idea, and of course Allah is the best of planners, that very soon after that I would find myself in the exact same situation, uh, finding out that I, you know, my, my now ex-husband was infertile, and so we couldn't have children. I had no idea that that was going to happen, but I had two months or three months, however long it was, of all the advice I was giving her, right? Everything I said to her was fresh in my mind. So when it came for me to face the exact same test, I was like, wow, okay, Allah, <laughs> thank you, alhamdulillah, because it was like I was, you know, counseling myself in a way through that, all those months. And it did, it helped me. It helped me tremendously to be able to remember all the things that I said to her. Um, and so that's, that's how sometimes it works, right? You're going through a difficulty, you're dealing with problems, whether they're your own or other people's, and you might not make those connections that that experience of living through those things are, is going to help you at some point or another, right? So just because you can't see that, doesn't mean that you're just being tortured for no reason, right? There is a wisdom, there is, um, a, a, you know, something um, that, that's happening that maybe time will tell. But to surrender trust to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what we're supposed to do. Like, Allah, if you're putting me through this, I know that there is wisdom. And I just, I'm just going to bear it with patience and get through it. And that doesn't mean you have to again, um, shut down all options to, to seek help and just suffer. Be, you know, l l resourceful, try to find help, do what you can, rely on people who have strong faith, you know, ask people for dua. Very important to ask people for dua. You know, I think we've become very private in certain ways where we don't um, ask for help no, we don't ask for du'a, but that's to our own detriment. So reach out and say, I'm going through some hardships. Please make du'a for me. And I'm, I've literally lived experiences where I'm like, I know just because I asked um, the, the du'a of some saintly person, I don't know who was answered. Because if you keep like that as a habit, where when you meet people, please make du'a for me, you'll see that, inshallah, things start to get easy. And you're like, wow, someone was likely remembering you in their du'a. And Allah says that when we remember people in their absence, it's du'a mustajab, right? So inshallah, use that, you know, do that. And just bear it with patience. But, but I really like that you mentioned that because, you know, having that perspective that whatever it is, it's maybe a protection from something worse, right? So alhamdulillah. Barakallah fiki. Yes, Salam Alaikum. Sure. That's a, uh, first of all, Jazakallah Khair, thank you for your comment and your question. So it's obviously a very, um, I mean, we'd, we'd have to be here for a while for me to answer that. But I, what I will say is, um, which is a good opportunity to mention this, is that in a couple of weeks' time, maybe, is it March 6th? So March 6th here at MCC, we are hosting a women's uh, a womanhood program on all of these topics. So you will get to hear from Dr. Haifa Yunus, Dr. Rania Awad, Dr. Amina Darwish, Ustad Mariam Amir, um, and Sister Babelwa Kwanili, and then myself. And we're going to talk about all of these uh, issues with respect to the role of woman, womanhood. What does that mean, right? And really understand these things because. It all really comes down to the framing, and a lot of us have been uh, taught to understand the role of women um, in, in very fragmented ways. Sometimes, you know, cultural, you know, uh, ideas and notions get mixed in with Islam, and so it's it just it's not clear. But that, that's why we need to learn our deen. And alhamdulillah, we have all of these female scholars that will be able to lay it all out. So I really hope that all of you will attend, and you'll let other women and young girls, especially. We have some youth here, so we need to give a shout out to them for being here um, and attending. But they are also welcome to attend, inshallah. And they should, if you have young girls or know any, please bring them because it's really powerful to learn your deen from other women. You know, I'm just speaking from experience, but I feel we're in that uh, time where um, we, we need to just... Um, 
take advantage of the opportunities that we have and we have amazing scholars in our community that we can learn from so come to that event and you'll get all these questions answered inshallah but thank you for for sharing that um you know and your and your comment as well it's really important that we share and that we're open you know i know these classes can sometimes seem formal because you're coming and you're hearing me read from a book but i do my goal with these halaqas is to really bring our hearts together and to create a sisterhood and we've had two years of covid and i'm just done and i know we're all done <laughs> so thank you for coming because alhamdulillah honestly when we first started back in person i was like man i don't know we're gonna have like five people two people three people but week after or month after month mashallah you guys show up and um uh, there are new faces here and there, but we're always welcome. So um, it's important, though, to hear real stories. That's why I'm kind of an open book, and I welcome that. So anybody else want a story, share, or share anything at all, please, bismillah, before we we close out. Yeah, more. Sure. Just bismillah. Uh, Habib, yeah, <laughs> Habib, exactly, I mean, why did he get so, um, he's so beloved, even non-Muslims absolutely love him, right, uh, Habib, you know, the, the um, I think he's Russian, uh, and then also uh, Muhammad Saleh, same, right, you have a lot of these athletes who, alhamdulillah, they have the strong spiritual grounding, and they will, they'll always mention Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they'll, they'll really give, credit where it's due and for us all of us everything that's the thing is you can talk about your talents and skills maybe in that way but if you really think every blessing every blessing and even the blessings that we don't even think about um a long time ago again um something that we don't think about Sheikh Hamza was mentioning uh you know something like eyelashes and I I always find that really interesting because that's what gratitude is is that the pro the exercise of gratitude is that you get to that micro level of like thinking, right? It's like you can see the big blessings, right? House, car, job, all of those things kind of are prominent and we understand those. But even the small blessings we don't account for, like eyelashes are a huge blessing or the hairs in our nose, like subhanAllah. Do, do we think about what a blessing it is that we have normal functions in that in those regard, right? In that regard. Or um, I mentioned this too the other day on, on Clubhouse when I was teaching, but you know, there are people who are incredible people. Like they're just, there's total signs of God. This man, I found his video, I think it was a, a TikTok or, or a reel or one of those videos, but he had, he's from Australia, and he had this horrible um, reaction to cortisol creams for treatment of eczema. He had eczema since childhood, so full, like, inflammation. Inflammation in his entire body, head to toe. I've never seen anything like that in my life before, where he had patches of skin and peeling skin, red, bleeding, uh, pus. It was just, subhanAllah, very hard to see someone in that state. But every video, hey, everyone, like, totally smiling, and he's like, how does a person like that exist, right? Because that's tormenting pain. He cannot move. He has to wear certain bands around his hands because his hands get very cracked. And he's home. He can't go outside because the sun will exacerbate his symptoms. But he manages to find the gratitude in Every video you find him smiling and so grateful. He's like, you know, because he's doing a treatment, um, he's, he's trying to rid himself of the dependency of these creams because they. he said, I just couldn't do it anymore. I, ca I can't live with the dependency on these creams. I need to find a way to overcome this, right? So he found, um, I think it's a Chinese practitioner, medicine uh, practitioner who's helping him. But he's, he's just so happy to report the smallest, like, look, this patch is getting better. And you just want to cry, like, that a person like that exists who can find the so much to be grateful for over the small patch of skin when his the rest, 99% of his body is... And, I mean, if I showed you a video, you really would understand how, you know, amazing it is to witness people like that. But that's the kind of process that we all need to do is to take you know, into consideration all the things that Allah has made very easy for us. Our mobility, to be able to move about, 
our sight, our faculties, right? Our taste buds, our hearing, our seeing, our sense of smell. You know, COVID, how many people do you know who lost their sense of taste and smell? They are miserable. I saw many people crying. Like, it's really difficult to go on with life when, you, when everything tastes metallic or, or like bitter. So we, if you didn't have that experience, you wouldn't know to be grateful for that. But once you see that, aren't you like, alhamdulillah? Right? So what if we were in the process of alhamdulillah all the time? Right? Alhamdulillah. When you see your, you know, your, your thumbs and you have the ability to move. I mean, just there's so much that if we really took time, um, that's how we increase right, our gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that we are always giving him the credit because you know, this is why we say alhamdulillah, right? All praise is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all my blessings, right? Alhamdulillah. Yes. I have a question when you were talking about mm -hmm. the focus of never like putting yourself above someone and judging someone. Yeah. Yes. Um, but and then how do you what's your advice for balancing that with also trying to keep yourself in company of people who are either bad at being or mm -hmm. evaluating like a spouse or something like that? Sure. Very good. Um we certainly can um you know be because you want to look at, again, your heart as the most important thing that you need to protect, right? So if your focus of creating boundaries in terms of the company that you keep or even with the selection of a spouse is not about them but about you, then you're not going to be self-righteous and arrogant, right? Because it's not like, oh, they're not good, at, you know, they're not good enough and you're just judging them for whatever deficiencies they have. You're going to look at it more like, I need to really, I need support. I need people who can help me. I need a spouse who can keep me in check, right? I need, I need friends who can help me because I'm weak to myself. So that lends that shift of focus from judging other people for what they lack because you don't know their struggles and you honestly don't know their state with God because someone could, right, externally look a certain way, but they could be very close to Allah. But it's just a matter of, I am in need of someone to help me, anchor me, and if I find that there's an incompatibility here, then I need, you know, to, to maybe look elsewhere. And that way you're not judging them for anything, but you're rather prioritizing preserving your heart. Does that make sense? Yeah. And just to keep humble because, you know, again, we don't know people's end. Someone could look... Um, you know, a certain way, and if you get that negative thought about them, you have to check yourself. Like, I don't know who they are with God. I have no idea. But I know what I need, right? I need someone who prays five times a day because I'm weak. I can't pray five times a day, right? So if someone's, you know, presenting with these, you know, um, issues and they're humble enough or honest enough to admit them to you, then it's okay for you to say, I, I wish it was diff we were under different circumstances, but I don't think this is going to work. Right in a marital situation, or if in friends, if you have friends who are not um, spiritually driven and they don't have, you know, those that's just not those aren't their interests, then you don't need to condemn them and kind of act like, oh, well, you're not good enough for me. But rather, like, I have to work on myself, and I really need supportive friends. I need people to help me, build me up. And right now, that's where I'm at. And then always keep the door open because by you you know, keeping that relationship open and the door open, maybe as you start, you know, gravitating more towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and strengthening, they'll want to come to your, your side, you know. And so we don't ever close doors on people like that. Like, oh, I just can't be your friend. It's just more about where you, you're, you know, the time that you spend. So if those friends want to um, hang out with you weekly, but you're like, oh, I don't think, you know, it's good for me, then you just slowly excuse yourself from those things being gentle, but check in on them. How are you? If you have a good reminder here, I, I, you know, I was thinking of you. Those are beautiful acts, you know, to keep the hearts connected and to prevent you from thinking, I'm, I'm done with that group because they're not good enough, right? So we should never do that. We should never do that. It's tough for law. Yeah, but thank you. It's a great question. Yes. Alaikum salam. Hmm. Um, so I'm sorry, I just want to make sure I'm clear on your question. So being humble towards someone who does, like who, who you find is maybe dishonoring you? Yeah, 
Right. Mm. Sure. So this is, it's a wonderful question. And I would say it's a very subjective question because every situation I think would have to be, you know, considered. Like there are hadith, for example, that say, yeah, we don't need, um, the, the believer should never put themselves in a situation where they are, dishonored or, you know, mistreated, and we should be able to defend ourselves against those who approach us, you know, in a, in a sort of antagonistic or whatever way. We, we're not, we don't, we, we don't need to subject ourselves to that kind of energy, right? So ha having boundaries is perfectly fine. But then there's other hadith that say that the one who mixes with those who are difficult and even maybe abusive, and that word, you know, it's, it's a translation. Um, so let's, that isn't, I don't want people to assume anything out of that, but more like, you know, the harsh, critical, right? Um, that it's better for them, you know, to, to, to mix with them than to not even have any relation with them at all. Because again, these are things, these are ways that we draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by, by preserving like family, for example, by not, you know, causing rifts, by not being overly, um, you know, uh, divisive in terms of like, forcing people to pick sides, you know, sometimes things can get out of hand, but just saying, you know what, it's okay. Sometimes, for example, um, you know, our elders, they may speak very frankly and harshly and critically, but is it worth it to, um, you know, go up and tell them off? All the of course not, you know. Uh, but some people may think, well, I need to create a boundary. So you kind of have to weigh, I think, every situation based on the actual relationship, what's at stake. And the person individual also has to think about, you know, their, um, what is the motivation behind what they're doing? Are they trying to correct uh, and maybe, you know, prevent this person from, because, you know, la darara wa la dirar, right? Don't harm and don't reciprocate harm. Are they trying to teach this person to stop because they're harmful and it, the intention is for their benefit as well? Or is it a nafsi reaction, like I think I'm so much, like I think I'm something and this person, who are they to talk to me that way and I need to put them in their place. That sort of internal dialogue has to happen in order for the person to really know what the motivation is, right? Because if you're honest with yourself and you're like, you know what, um, I don't want them, I need to, you know, maybe create that boundary because they're harming other people and they're, you know, um, they, and they just, you know, they, I need to help them, like, right, so that they stop harming. And inshallah, you know, we can maintain the family bond and, and I'll do it with decorum and, and, you know, adab and all that. The intention's pure, right? But if it's just like, nope, I'm going to go in and tell them off and then get my just desserts and walk away feeling valiant, you know, like as if you did something great, then clearly the intention is self-serving, right? It's not for mutual benefit or it's not for a greater benefit. So I think it's a very, very deep, um, you know, subjective, you know, process that the person would have to go through. But I hope that was clear. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. MashaAllah. Any other questions, ladies? We have reached the hour, so I don't want to keep you longer. But I also want to make sure that everybody gets their questions answered. Alhamdulillah. All right, Jazakumullah khair. And we'll end in du'a. So for next time, we'll pick up um, this. We're still on the introduction. As you can see, this text is very, mashallah, there's so much to say. So it'll take us some time, but Nia is, is to eventually finish it. So please get it if you don't have it. Okay? Yeah. I'm just going to keep going, inshallah, until you guys, you know, even if one of you shows up, I'll be here. <laughs> inshallah. <laughs> All right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal asr inna l-insana la fi khusr illa al-ladhina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasu bil-haqi wa tawasu bil-sabr. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdika shadwan la ilaha ila anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله جزاكم الله خيرا everyone إن شاء الله have a wonderful um, evening keep safe it's uh, the night of Jum'ah do your salawat إن شاء الله and remember us in your dua okay, thank you السلام عليكم